A warm welcome to one and all. This is Dr. Sunil Manuel, Associate Professor from the Department of Orthopedics. Today, we'll do a deep dive into the examination of the elbow. Before we start examining the elbow, I think we should start with a perspective of the elbow with relation to the upper limb. And therefore, I start by putting up a picture of the upper limb. Even if you are examining the elbow of a patient or even if you are examining the shoulder of a patient or even if you are examining the wrist of the patient, we, whenever we examine any one of these joints, we need to see the examination findings in, with regards to the total limb. So basically what is happening is in orthopedics we have five subsystems. So I like to call it like that, definitely it is not given in any books. But then the first subsystem that we are dealing with is the right upper limb. The next subsystem that we are dealing with is the left upper limb. The third subsystem would be the right lower limb. And the fourth subsystem would be the left lower limb. And finally, of course, we have the spine. So whenever we talk about elbow examination, we have to see our examination findings with regards to how it is affecting the entire function of the upper limb. So that is very important. I will give you an example. Sometimes what happens is a disease of the elbow may cause some functional limitations of the elbow. At that time what happens is there will be compensatory mechanisms that take place both in the shoulder and in the wrist to take care of these deficiencies. So that is the concept. So how do you understand all this? You understand all this by not seeing this patient as a patient for elbow examination. You are going to see this patient as a total upper limb case. So that is how you are going to manage. So therefore whenever you see, whenever you do examination of a joint, whether it is the shoulder joint or the elbow joint or wrist joint, you have to see the, to the whole limb in perspective. Okay. So this is a picture of the elbow joint uh, or the bones that make up the elbow joint. Now why I put this picture is I just want to introduce you to some nomenclatures here so that because I will be repeatedly using these words further in the uh, class. So the first thing that I want you to know is that we have the distal humerus that articulates with the proximal ulna and the proximal radius. So this is an articulation where one bone is articulating with two bones. So that is a very strange kind of a scenario. So same thing happens even in the knee joint where the femur comes and articulates with the tibia as well as with the patella. So similarly where here what you are having is you are having a bone that is actually coming and articulating with two different bones. And these two different distal bones that is the ulna and the radius have got totally different characteristics. So that is what you need to understand. So the ulna articulates with the trochlea okay and the radius that is the proximal radius articulates with something called the capitula so that is the differentiation now why you need to know this is because in your examination you will realize that all these have got significance the other important thing is the bony prominences i want you to understand all the bony prominences here bony prominences means the parts of the bone that are actually palpable from outside and those prominences which you can actually name. One of the first bony prominences is the medial epicondyle and then you on the lateral side you also have the lateral epicondyle. So how do you identify this medial epicondyle? You will have to come along this ridge as you that is called the medial supracondylar ridge. As you come down along the ridge you can actually as I am speaking you can actually start palpating your own elbows and just appreciate this. So we have something called a medial supracondylar ridge. As you come down along the medial supracondylar ridge, you will notice that there is a protuberance or a bony protuberance that is called the medial epicondyle. Same thing with the, along the lateral side. As you come along the lateral supracondylar ridge, we have the lateral epicondyle. Okay, added to that, now the other bony prominence is the olecranon, olecranon process posteriorly. So this olecranon pro process posteriorly is again very easily palpable as you come along the subcutaneous border of the ulna. So it is easily palpable. 
another thing that's a little difficult to palpate, I'll show you later how to palpate, would be the head of the radius. Now the head of the radius, as you can see, it's not very protuberant. However, you can actually make this head of the radius palpate, uh, palpable by doing a small maneuver, that is by rotating the radius. And how do you rotate the radius? You rotate the radius by doing pronation and supination. Now, this is something uh, very beautiful. I want you to understand what's happening here. Uh, this is in elbow in extension, how it looks, and elbow in flexion. So, in extension, you will notice that the under surface, that the under surface of the distal humerus articulates with the olecranon. And the under surface of the capitulum articulates with the radial head. But in flexion, you will see that the anterior surface of the trochlea articulates with the olecranon and the anterior surface of the capitulum articulates with the radius. So this is the view from the medial side. The same thing which is viewed from the lateral side. What you can see here again is the beautiful, actually what is happening is if you notice the distal humerus comes down like this and the capitulum is off center, it's up outside, it's gone out of the plane. It's a nice protuberance outside which gives articulation to the head of the radius. It's got some significance. What is the significance? When I come to that section, I will tell you. Okay. The next thing is, this is again a beautiful diagram from Netter, where he is actually shown the articulation, shown exactly how the joint looks. Or this is nothing but opening up of the joint capsule. So he's opened up the joint capsule anteriorly here, and he's opened up the joint <coughs> capsule posteriorly here. So what you can see is, there is a lip anteriorly to the olecranon, uh, not the olecranon, the proximal uh, ulna and this lip is called the coronoid process. So in full flexion, this coronoid process is going to come and hit the anterior surface of the humerus here. So you need some cushioning, right? And that cushioning is actually given by this beautiful fat pad inside. The same thing when you turn the uh, joint, you see that the olecranon every time we extend comes and hits against the posterior surface of the distal humerus and there again there is a fat pad here a beautiful fat pad that gives the cushioning now this is a little complicated diagram don't bother about any of these things uh, labeled here uh, the most beautiful thing about uh, netter's diagrams is, are that it's a little over labeled so uh, definitely good for a beginner but then once you are trying to understand something it may be a little distracting I just want you to focus on three structures here, that's all. On the medial side, you have something called the ulnar collateral ligament. This is akin to the medial collateral ligament that we have in the knee joint. On the lateral side, we have another collateral ligament that is called the radial collateral ligament. And this is similar to the lateral collateral ligament of the knee joint. Now, what I want you to understand is there is a, a lot of similarity between the elbow joint as well as the knee joint. So, we have the ulnar collateral ligament on the medial side and the radial collateral ligament on the lateral side. These two collateral ligaments are the ones that are giving stability to the elbow. These are the ones that are preventing the elbow joint from dislocating. So, ulnar collateral ligament which is on the medial side prevents, prevents valgus stress or prevents the joint opening up on the medial side. It holds up together. The radial collateral ligament on the lateral side prevents water stress. And there is a third structure that I want you to carefully see is this structure called the annular ligament of the radius. It goes all around the radius as you can see here. So basically what is this annular ligament doing? This annular ligament is again made up of fibrous tissue on the outside and cartilage in a cartilage on the inside so though it is not related no, not a bone still basically what you can see is there is a lot of uh, there is cartilage inside almost articulating with the proximal radius and why is this annular ligament impo important because this annular ligament is the tie that keeps the uh, proximal radius in place because I told you, when we are doing pronation and supination, there is going to be a lot of turning of the radius. Pronation, supination, the radius almost turns 
180 degrees and as the radius is turning definitely there's a chance for the radius to slip off posteriorly or slip off anteriorly it is the annular ligament that is holding the proximal radius in place so uh, any clinical examination class that i do for students would be uh, to build on anatomy because you can just cannot understand clinical examination and unless you have a very good knowledge of the anatomy of that area so that is what we have done now we have built up the anatomical knowledge okay so now we will come to the clinical examination of the elbow and uh, all of you are in lockdown you people are in your houses and i'm sure you have people at home it could be your dad mom and uh, you know siblings and people like that i want you to once you finish with this class and uh, you know you reflect on this class which i hope you do i want you to do a thorough clinical examination of the elbow of a normal person unless you examine normal elbows you will not at all be able to understand the difference or understand or pick up a pathological elbow that is one thing the other thing is like if you have a dad and a mom at home then you will have two different types of elbows a uh, slightly fat filled elbow of a woman and slightly muscular elbow like the one that you are seeing here of a man and there again there are lots of differences which i want you to be able to appreciate okay so coming to the elbow inspection so we are seeing this elbow from anteriorly and uh, i basically want you to ignore these uh, dilated veins so once you ignore ignore the dilated veins then what you have is three different muscle masses so the first muscle mass that we are seeing here is the flexor compartment of the arm the second big muscle mass that you are seeing here is the mobile vad and mobile vad w a d vad means purse okay and the third big muscle mass that you are seeing here is the flexor compartment or the flexor muscles of the forearm now all of you can actually extend your elbow and appreciate this so we have three muscle masses the first muscle mass the second muscle mass and the third muscle mass and uh, basically what is the importance of this muscle masses in between these muscle masses you clearly have some depressions and therefore anteriorly in the elbow you have a depression and what is the importance of this depression this depression is the first thing to disappear when you have an elbow swelling due to an injury or an inflammation if you have an elbow swelling then the whole thing looks like a bulbous swelling you will clearly not be able to differentiate the differences between these muscle masses as well as you will not be able to see this uh, depression in the cubital fossa of the elbow so the moment you a patient walks into my opd and hands out his elbow to me on inspection itself i know i am having an inflamed elbow why is it inflamed or is it a uh, inflammatory effusion is it a soft tissue effusion is it a hemarthrosis or a blood collection in the joint that was a secondary but the first thing that i know is that this elbow has got a swelling the other thing same thing happens when you look at it posteriorly what you have is you have the projection of the olecranon and you also have a nice wrinkled skin so all of you can actually feel the back of your elbow you will feel a nice loose skin on the olecranon and then what happens is you have your triceps coming out the same mobile vad i told you is seen on the lateral side and the bulge of these muscles of the flexor muscles is seen on the medial side so basically again you have these two depressions on either side of the olecranon they are called the paratricipital depressions or paratricipital grooves and these grooves tend to get filled up when you have an elbow effusion so this is a very important inspectory finding now what is this mobile vad made up of this mobile vad is made up of three powerful muscles gives a nice contour to the elbow and that would be the brachioradialis the extensor carpi radialis longus and the extensor carpi radialis brevis now having understood this i also want you to appreciate the muscle mass of the uh, uh, flexor compartment of the arm the muscle mass of the extensor compartment of the arm the muscle mass of the forearm and the muscle mass of the forearm both 
anteriorly and posteriorly. So these are all inspectory findings. Because now when you're doing inspection, I want you to understand that we have no permission to touch the patient. No permission to touch. So everything is inspection. So in the inspection, you're going to find these points. The other thing, you're also going to look for whether there are any scars, is there any sinuses which are indicative of some old infection or uh, you're also going to look for any dilated veins. Again, here I wanted to appreciate that these dilated veins are normal. We want to look for pathological dilated veins. You also want to look for any visible pulsations that indicates a brachial artery aneurysm. So those are the things that you're looking for anteriorly. Posteriorly, of course, you're looking for again sinuses, scars, uh, dilated veins, but pulsations unlikely because we don't have any blood vessel going posteriorly in the elbow. Okay, so from here we'll move to the first inspectory finding. So this is a very schematic diagram, but a classic diagram of an elbow tuberculosis. So basically what happens when a patient with elbow tuberculosis comes to you, he's got massive wasting of his arm, massive wasting of his forearm, with a swollen elbow. That is almost reverse of what is normal. Normally what you should have, you should have a muscle bulk in the arm, muscle bulk in the forearm, and a thinned out area in the elbow. But this the reverse is true when you have a patient with a, who is coming to you with a chronic infection. If when a patient comes to you with an acute infection or an acute inflammation, you will have, surely you will have swelling of the elbow, but the muscle masses are not wasted because the patient has still not going, gone, started going into the phase of atrophy. So when you have muscle mass wasting of the arm and the forearm with the swelling of the elbow, you can be sure that this patient is suffering from many, many days. That is one thing. So all these are inspectory findings. This is the beauty of inspection especially in the elbow so that easily even before the patient opens his mouth and starts talking you know okay I'm dealing with a chronic problem or okay I'm dealing with an acute problem you can clearly make the differentiation now this is a clinical picture of how an elbow swelling would look and uh, basically what happens is again this whole area this is this is the elbow and just distal to the elbow the whole area is swollen Clearly, you can make out the <coughs> how an elbow swelling looks. Now, this one here is a generalized swelling of the elbow. This one here is a very localized swelling of the elbow. You can clearly see the difference. Here you see his paratricipital groove is still maintained. In spite of that, he is having a localized swelling of the elbow. So, this is nothing but an inflammation of an olecranon bursa or an olecranon bursitis. So that is what it is. Okay. So you should be able to differentiate not just between swellings, but you should also be able to differentiate between a generalized swelling and a localized swelling. So similarly, you can also have ganglion cysts, which are localized swellings. You can have lipomas, you can have incidental neurofibromas, all of which would be localized swellings in the elbow. Now the next important thing that you want to inspect in the patient is the carrying angle of the elbow. So all of us know that we have something called a carrying angle. Definitely you have learnt it in uh, anatomy. So I will just refresh your knowledge of carrying angle. The carrying angle is the angle formed between the long axis of the humerus or long axis of the arm with the long axis of the forearm. So that it forms an angle here, a small angle between the long axis of the arm and long axis of the forearm. So that would be the carrying angle. So the normal carrying angle is around 11 degrees in males and around 13 degrees in females. So um, again, so this guy is not actually clearly demonstrating the carrying angle because this is not the way to stand. Whenever we are demonstrating the carrying angle, we have to get the medial side of the elbow coming close to the body. Okay, like uh, how this picture is put. Then only we will be able to appreciate the carrying angle. But what I wanted to appreciate in this picture is the carrying angle just disappears when the patient flexes the elbow. So that is the concept here. So we have a, carrying, a normal carrying angle for the elbow and this carrying angle just disappears the moment the patient flexes the elbow. Now here is where I am showing you the difference between the 
carrying angle in a male which is around 11 degrees definitely there is going to be a range and in women which is um, uh, 13 degrees now uh, traditionally when i was a student it was taught that uh, carrying angle is more in women because they have a wider pelvis definitely that could be true but there is nothing to prove that that is the reason so we'll just leave it at that it's just it's enough if you know as a student that the patient has a the women have a higher carrying ang angle as compared to men now why did this carrying angle come that is a question and second thing second question is why did the carrying angle disappear in flexion so this is some fun, something very fundamental that that student should know so the carrying angle is actually caused because of the articulation between the trochlea that is this structure here and the upper end of the ulna so this this articulation causes the carrying angle as you can see there is a tilt of the trochlea when you go from lateral to medial you can definitely see that the trochlea is tilted downwards because it is tilted downwards in extension what will happen the under surface of the trochlea will come in contact with the upper surface of the proximal ulna and because it is tilted in this direction the ulna tends to go outwards do you understand this so this is the reason why the carrying angle appears in extension however what happens in flexion when we flex the elbow the anterior surface of the trochlea comes in the contact with the anterior surface of the ulna and therefore well, basically the problem here is there there is no tilt in the anterior surface of the trochlea the tilt in the trochlea is there only in the under surface so the moment it moves from extension to flexion the anterior surface of the trochlea comes in contact with the anterior surface of the uh, comes in contact with the proximal ulna and therefore the carrying angle disappears so what is the importance of this the importance of this concept is whenever you are checking the carrying angle of a patient the prerequisite is that the patient should have complete extension so let's say a patient does not have complete extension of the elbow if a patient does not have a complete extension of the elbow then even if there is a deficiency in the carrying angle or a pathology in the carrying angle we are not supposed to comment about the carrying angle that's very very important and as a student you can show your knowledge of the subject to the teacher by telling that i examine the patient to assess the carrying angle however i am not able to quantify the carrying angle because the patient is not able to completely extend his elbow that would be your answer and you have to make a clear mention of this sentence so if the patient has got any deficiency due to any any reason that he is not able to completely extend his elbow then no comment about the carrying angle should be made that's important okay right so uh, that is done this is done okay now here i just want you to forget uh, ignore these numbers because these numbers are obviously wrong but then i like this picture so i just pulled out this picture from the internet uh, so basically what we are seeing here is we are seeing a normal carrying angle and i told you very clearly that the normal carrying angle in a male is around 11 degrees and the normal carrying angle in a female is around 13 degrees now in this patient the second this is normal the first one is normal in the second patient what we are seeing is the patient has got more than uh, is got a higher carrying angle so here this condition is called cubitus valgus because of a higher carrying angle here the patient's carrying angle is reduced but essentially he has not gone into varus deformity so in this patient we would call it as cubitus rectus rec tus just like you have the rectus femoris recta uh, rectus means straight basically so here the elbow has lost its normal carrying angle it is definitely not uh, not physiological it is pathological only however we will not call it as a cubitus varus to call it a cubitus varus 
it should have reversed its direction inwards or medially then only we will be able to call it a cubitus valgus so what you have here is normal what you have here is cubitus valgus what you have here is cubitus rectus and what you here have here is cubitus valgus so i'm sure you've understood the difference and also very important all these things is still inspection we are still in inspection of the elbow therefore here we have not measured the carrying angle we are just inspected the carrying angle of the patient like this so it's an inspectory finding so what about the quantification of carrying angle yes the quantification of carrying angle will come much later in the section on measurements so in orthopedics in general for any joint the general param general headings would be inspection of the joint second palpation of the joint third assessment of the range of movements of the joint fourth assessment of deformities of the joint fifth other measurements like girth carrying angle and all those things and finally we go for some special tests okay so we are still in inspection right so this is a cubitus so this is uh, on the left side the person is normal on the right side the patient has clearly got a cubitus valgus now this looks like a gun and therefore it's also called as a gun stock deformity a cubitus valgus is the most common complication after a mal united supracondylar fracture reverse now this child again on the left side he is normal but on the right side he has got a cubitus valgus it has gone into valgus reverse again this child has got a cubitus valgus on this side now when this child has got a cubitus valgus it is this x ray belongs to this child basically what has happened it's happened because of a non union of the lateral condyle fracture so this lateral condyle fracture has not united and therefore there is continued growth on the medial side because the medial side is normal but the lateral side there is no growth and continued growth on the medial side but without growth on the lateral side has led to an asymmetric growth which has led to cubitus valgus so cubitus valgus is most commonly seen as a complication of non union of a lateral condyle fracture especially in a growing child okay now because of this overgrowth on the medial side we also know that there is a tiny structure called the ulnar nerve which is hooking behind the medial epicondyle and going into the forearm so this ulnar nerve what happens is over a period of time slowly it starts getting stretched depending on the increase in the uh, deformity as the deformity increases the ulnar nerve also goes on getting stretched and slowly the ulnar nerve starts getting paralyzed and because there is a slow process sometimes this process may occur over 1 to 2 decades that means it takes 10 to 20 years for it to occur and therefore because it's a slow process this condition is called tardy t a r d y tardy ulnar nerve palsy now this child or this adult i don't know whether it's a child or adult is clearly showing a tardy ulnar palsy by by having a claw hand in the medial two digits can you see this it's a claw hand of the medial two digits and this claw hand in the medial two digits suggests that this patient is having a not just a cubitus valgus but also a a tardy ulnar nerve palsy now if this boy walks into my opd he doesn't even have to open his mouth and tell me his history i know the diagnosis straight away that is the beauty of understanding clinical examination and that is the beauty of the understanding inspectory findings and correlating it with the diagnosis okay so we finished with see looking for the carrying angle and here i am doing a cursory examination of the ray, of the movements of the elbow i want all my students to clearly understand but by checking the elbow extension of this patient i am not measuring his elbow extension neither am i measuring the range of his elbow extension nor am i measuring the power of his elbow extension what i am actually doing in my patient is i am just making a cursory inspectory examination to see whether this elbow extension is there in my patient 
okay so still this elbow extension is an inspectory finding and this inspectory finding is very important for me only if i know that my patient has got complete elbow extension then only i will be subjecting him to check his carrying angle because i told you the prerequisite for checking the carrying angle would be to have a normal elbow extension okay right and now so the moment i did that i have another patient here and this guy does not have complete extension so this patient i know does not have complete extension could be any reason it could be a post traumatic stiffness or a bone block doesn't matter but for this patient i am not going to check the uh, carrying angle so that is important okay and this patient is not able to completely extend his elbow and therefore an inability to completely extend your elbow and bring it to the neutral position what is neutral position this is the neutral position and if your patient is not able to bring his limb upper limb back into the neutral position at the elbow i will call it a deformity okay you may you can agree with me that this is a deformity because this is normal a patient should have complete elbow extension i i would encourage all of you to just extend your elbow and see whether you have a deformity or a flex flexion deformity or you have complete extension now this patient has got a deformity but sir why did you name it flexion deformity sir i named it flexion deformity because the deformity looks to be in flexion understand so that is how the name comes it's a deformity and it is in flexion and therefore i would call it a flexion deformity and the fact that he is not able to bring it to complete neutral position of extension i can also call it a fixed flexion deformity same principle applies everywhere else so whenever i have a patient with fixed flexion deformity i know that the reverse movement that is the complete extension up to neutral is not possible that's what it means the other thing is a fixed flexion deformity does not mean that the patient does not have any further flexion this patient though he is looking like he is in a deformed flexed position he will have further flexion but he does not have further extension so how do you it's a little confusing so how do you remember it i will remember it that this is a deformity point number 1 and the limb appears to be in flexion therefore i would call it a fixed flexion deformity of the elbow therefore because it's a fixed flexion deformity i know that the patient has further flexion but does not have further extension again i want to emphasize that we are still in inspection and this is an inspectory finding okay now uh, this is again now we did extension sometimes what happens we see this hyper extension the hyper extension is usually seen very very commonly in children and also in adolescent women uh, so uh, this is my favorite test to actually check for hyper extension now make the patient abduct both the shoulders and you can have a beautiful view of the symmetry of the elbow and the moment you are seeing that one elbow is hyper extended as compared to the other then probably there is a problem if both elbows are hyper extended symmetrically then absolutely no problem that is normal for that patient it may not be normal for uh, normal when compared to your elbow but it is perfectly normal for that patient so this is hyper extension so what was the step the step was to check for elbow extension as we did the elbow extension checking we found that one patient did not have a elbow extension we called him a flexion deformity patient and our other patient obviously she is happy so that means she is normal and she has got hyper extension this also can occur in patients who have joint laxity or ligament laxity now same way i am also checking for elbow flexion again if you notice i can actually measure the elbow flexion but no 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 i am not supposed to touch the patient i am still in inspection and therefore what i would do is i would just 
look at the patient's elbow flexion and the best place to look at the elbow flexion is from the lateral side because I am clearly able to know that uh, the uh, range of flexion and when I am doing this please remember that I will also be checking both the elbows simultaneously so the pathological elbow will be compared with the normal elbow then only I will come to know whether the patient has got normal flexion one of the important things especially this guy is very muscular so in him only I will give you that uh, concept the concept is the elbow flexion is limited by the bulk of the biceps or uh, biceps brachialis biceps and brachialis and the bulk of the forearm muscles so you will notice that guys who are pile ones or muscular guys will have less flexion as compared to skinny winny people who will have more flexion why because eventually in a normal patient the flexion is limited by this uh, muscle bulk of the biceps touching the muscle bulk of the proximal forearm the normal range that we are looking for is between 130 135 to around 150 degrees that's a normal range so again i want to emphasize that this is an inspectory finding so now we have finished elbow inspection and we are in elbow palpation now do you notice that the slide is empty the slide is empty because i have some remarks to make before and if you notice i have got not got much text in any of my slides it's only pictures because uh, pictures are all that is going to tell you what it is and in palpation the first thing that you are looking for when you are palpating the elbow is you are looking for localized rise of temperature and how do you make out that there is a localized rise of temperature by doing two things you are going to make out that the localized rise of temperature over the elbow either anteriorly or posteriorly is localized by touching the other parts of the body that is one the other thing you are also going to confirm that this is a localized rise of temperature by touching the other elbow okay that is one the other thing is second important palpatory thing is you are palpating for the bony prominences and the soft tissue area so soft tissue points so now what i am going to do is i am just going to take you through all the bony prominences and all the soft tissue points for palpation of the elbow okay so the first bony point is um, the olecranon so this is a picture from behind and the examiner is palpating the olecranon so this is actually this is a book very old a book black and white book written in the 80s and i'm sure you will also understand that uh, a clinical examination hasn't changed and will not change uh, for the next few uh, centuries uh, however, one disagreement I have with this book is all the palpation that the examiner is doing is with the tip of the index finger. I like to palpate with the tip of my thumb and I would also definitely recommend that all of you also palpate the patient with the tip of the thumb. Okay, so this patient, this the examiner is now palpating the olecranon or the tip of the olecranon. That is the first bony prominence. The next bony prominence is the examiner is palpating the lateral epicondyle as his palm so again how did he localize that that is the lateral condyle he goes higher up here and feeds the supracondylar ridge you can also take your hand go to your supracondylar ridge and from there as you come down suddenly you will see that there is a nice bony prominence here and that is the lateral epicondyle now the lateral epicondyle when you palpate sometimes you can have tenderness there and that is a sign of Later, lateral epicondylitis is also called tennis elbow tennis elbow is a very common condition that we see in a lot of patients again easy clinical diagnosis and therefore you can actually examine the patient by palpating the lateral epicondyle now here the, the examiner is on the medial side and as he comes along the supracondylar ridge he is palpating the medial epicondyle so now he's got three points. What are the three points? He's got olecranon, lateral epicondyle, and medial epicondyle. And these, and again, tenderness of the medial epicondyle causes a uh, is, is uh, suggestive of a condition called the medial epicondylitis. This medial epicondylitis is also referred to as golfer's elbow. So I forgot to tell you something. 
the lateral the olecranon tip also can sometimes be tender when the olecranon tip is tender it could be because of two reason one is because of inflammation of the olecranon tip itself secondly and more commonly it's because of inflammation of a bursa that we have there that bursa is required for cushioning the olecranon tip and sometimes what happens the bursa itself may get inflamed and that will cause a condition called student's elbow okay so now taking these three points together which is that which is medial epicondyle lateral epicondyle and olecranon tip we see that in a flexed elbow it forms a beautiful triangle so this is a flexed elbow and this is an extended elbow so these three points form a triangle i just want you to know that it forms a triangle and on extension of the elbow what happens the olecranon shifts upwards or olecranon tip shifts upwards and the three points come to lie in a straight line so this is called the three bony point relationship of the elbow and since these three points are easily palpable especially in children who are most likely injured in uh, injured in the uh, elbow this is a very valuable clinical examination finding so whenever you have children at home or if you have any siblings at home please make good use of their elbows and practice checking for the three bony point relationship as you can understand this examination is done from behind there's no point in standing in front and checking for these three points you have to go behind and ideally speaking you even have to mark the points okay so that's the triangle and this is elbow flexion and this here is elbow extension you will see that the three points converge to a straight line again because these are skin points they are not bone points these points are made in the skin you will notice that the skin is also very slippery there and therefore the points are only an estimate but it is very important that you be able to appreciate this and if you have any doubt in the patient when you are examining the patient also has got a normal elbow on the other side you can actually mark the points on the normal elbow and confirm your findings so i'll give you a simple practical uh, importance of this so this is the normal relationship uh, but unfortunately there's a fracture here what fracture is this this is called a supracondylar fracture a very common fracture that we see in children in spite of this patient having a supracondylar fracture you will notice that the medial condyle lateral uh, medial condyle lateral condyle and the olecranon tip that the three bony point relationship is well maintained so supracondylar fracture three bony point relationship is well maintained now supracondylar fracture is a very very common question that is asked for undergraduate students so when you tell about the clinical findings of supracondylar fracture and if you tell that in supracondylar fracture the three bony point relationship is well maintained my class today is definitely worth it now coming to the three bony point relationship here this is a elbow dislocation what is happening here the elbow dislocation the three bony point relationship is gone why because the lateral epicondyle and medial epicondyle are in place however when the elbow dislocates what happens to the olecranon the olecranon is gone somewhere else so therefore the three bony point relationship is not maintained or the three bony point relationship is lost and therefore we will say that this patient has got a loss of the three bony point relationship very often it is not easy for a student to actually be able to clearly pick up this thing but if you did us do one small common sense thing of examining the other side it will be very very obvious that something is wrong in this elbow and the three bony point relationship is gone so that is where i'm again emphasizing that you have to examine the opposite side so that is where the that is the importance of the three bony point relationship and now i just giving you a perspective we are still in palpation we have only palpated three bony points and the moment we palpated the three bony points we have come to this concept of the three bony point relationship now moving further in the palpation now here in this picture is this the, the exam is trying to figure out the same point and now i'm happy he is using his thumb the tip of his thumb this is exactly what i wanted him to do and this is how we examine all patients now here you will notice that his arm forearm is in supination and here the forearm is in 
pronation. So supination, pronation, supination, pronation. So repeatedly supinating and pronating, what is going to happen? Something is going to move there. And what is that that's going to move? The radial head is going to rotate. And this radial head rotation can be appreciated by, by this thumb. Now what is the landmark for this thumb? Very simple. We already know the landmark for the lateral epicondyle. This point is 2 cm distal to the lateral epicondyle. In a child, it would be 1 to 1.5 cm. But a standard answer is, it is 2 cm distal to the lateral epicondyle in the same line. What is this point? This point is the radial head. It is, it is appreciated by pronation and supination repeatedly of the forearm that will lead to rotation of the radial head and this rotating of the radial head can be felt by this thumb which is placed there. Now we are on the medial side. Now again it looks like he is actually checking at the medial epicondyle but no. He is gone slightly posterior to the medial condyle and he is looking for a nice cord there. C-O-R-D cord. That cord is nothing but the ulnar nerve. So basically what happens is here the medial epicondyle is already found. We already found out the medial epicondyle. We go slightly posteriorly and we try to roll the ulnar nerve there. Okay. Two important things. We will be able to feel the ulnar nerve and in comparison to the opposite side, we will also be able to feel thickening of the ulnar nerve which is a characteristic feature of leprosy. And leprosy commonly affects the ulnar nerve at that point and leads to a claw hand. So a patient with claw hand comes, we are all going to examine the patient's ulnar nerve by rolling the ulnar nerve there. The other thing is, since we have localized the ulnar nerve there, we can also check for thinal sign or paresthesia in the, the, in the area of the uh, supply of the ulnar nerve. That's a totally different concept. So I leave thinal sign there itself. So now coming to the next test. So here I am doing, doing a test. So this test is called the Cousin's test. Basically, this test is done to look for, uh, apart from to look for a tennis elbow. So already I told you one way of looking for tennis elbow is by pressing on the lateral epicondyle and eliciting tenderness. Some patients may not have tenderness. However, when the patient is made to pronate his forearm and dorsiflex his rest against resistance given by the examiner what is expected to happen at the common extensor origin which is the lateral epicondyle there is going to be contraction and pull of the extensor muscles which are the extensor muscles which are getting pulled the extensor carpi radialis longus and the extensor carpi radialis brevis and this extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis is also inflamed in tennis elbow and this test, therefore the Cousin's test basically is a test where the patient pronates his forearm and dorsiflexes his wrist against resistance given by the examiner. And now we are looking for elbow stability. <coughs> we want to check for valgus st stress and we also want to check for varus stress. So here what happens is you can see this direction of the arrow indicates the direction in which the examiner is checking. So examiner this what is this this test varus test and the valgus test is very similar to what we learn in the knee. In the knee we have called we have the valgus stress test and the varus stress test. This is also very similar. Here what happens is the first thing the examiner does is he stabilizes the arm and then he grasps the forearm and tries to open up the elbow medially. So by doing a valgus stress he is trying to check whether the medial collateral ligament or the ulnar collateral ligament is intact. So that is what this test is doing. Now reverse. Again he stabilizes the, the arm. This is the arm, this is the elbow, this is the forearm. And now this time he is giving a varus stress. So when he gives a varus stress, he is actually looking whether the lateral collateral ligament or the radial collateral ligament of the elbow is intact. So the, we have the valgus stress test and a varus stress test. Okay, so now we are sort of done with palpation of the elbow. Okay, and uh, let me also confess here that there are lots of other tests for some complex rotator, rotatory instability of the elbow. 
I would definitely not want undergraduate students to uh, be knowledgeable about it simply because it's too confusing and therefore I have consciously omitted it. Uh, so please bear with me and I'm sure you'll also appreciate the fact that I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible. Now from there we move to the range of movement examination of the elbow. Now I want you to all, uh, all the students to understand a very simple concept in orthopedics which you can apply for many other joint examinations. The first thing is when an orthopedician is looking for the movements of, the L of any joint, he is interested in the range of movements. That means he wants to know whether it is 30 degree flexion, 40 degree flexion, 70 degree flexion or in a, a joint which has got extension he wants to know whether it is 10 degree extension, 20 degree. An orthopedician is interested in the range of movements. But what about a neurologist or a physician? A neurologist or a physician is interested in the power of the movement because he is looking at the neurological examination of the movement. That doesn't mean that I am not interested in the power, but first I will always look at the range of movements and later on I will actually take the patient through the examination of the power if I am suspecting a neurological weakness. Otherwise, in general, orthopedicians do not check the power. So whenever I say elbow movements, you should tell me the range. You should tell me, sir, your patient has got 15 degrees of elbow flexion. But when a physician asks you for the movements of the elbow, you will have to tell him, sir, your patient has got a 4 by 5 power in the elbow, unless asked otherwise. Okay, so that's, that's the thing. So now what is happening here? We have something that looks like a scale uh, and a protractor and basically we are checking for range of movements of the elbow. So basically that instrument that we have here is something called a goniometer. Okay. So even I had never seen a goniometer. If you have never seen a goniometer, it is fine. But I am sure you should know that there is an instrument called a goniometer uh, until at least uh, you finish your exams and later on you can take up whichever subject that you want to do. So this goniometer has got two long arms. The arms are placed in such, kept in such a way that, give, that they move towards your reference point and the center of the goniometer has got a hinge around which you can actually turn the goniometer. And this should rest at the point of the elbow if you are looking for elbow range of movement. If you are looking at wrist range of movement, this area should rest at the wrist and the arms of the goniometer should go in different directions. Now coming back to elbow range of movements. So here the two reference points for our goniometer would be the acromion at the shoulder that, that is called the tip of the acromion. Again a very palpable point and the radial styloid process again a very palpable point. So these two would be the references to which the goniometer has to point and the goniometer should be centered at the elbow and it should be kept on the lateral side. So once you do this, from here you will be taking the patient into flexion and identify the degrees to which the patient has got. So this is how you examine the range of movements of the elbow. Now uh, coming to range of the elbow, thankfully for me I don't have to tell a lot of ranges because I told you the elbow is a hinge joint and therefore it has got only around 130 to 140 degrees of flexion and added to that we have around 5 to 10 degrees of extension beyond the neutral. So elbow extension is just 5 to 10 degrees. I'll show you what is extension. So this is what is what he is actually what he is checking for here is extension. <laughs> okay so normally in he keeps in neutral position from there he tells the patient to extend. So the moment you realize that as you try to extend there is complete locking of the elbow that happens because the olecranon process goes and hits against the posterior surface of the distal humerus. So that extension is just 5 to 10 degrees. So this is how we check for elbow range of movements. Now uh, you look at the zeal and enthusiasm with which he is checking the elbow range of movements. That's because he is checking for something between 5 and 10 degrees and he wants to be very accurate about it. But let me give you a rule of thumb any elbow injury or any elbow uh, the mo elbow is a very sensitive uh, joint so the moment you have an elbow injury 
or an elbow inflammation or infection there is a good chance that your terminal range of movement of the elbow is lost what do i mean by terminal range of movement there is a good chance that the 0 to 10 or 0 to 20 degrees of the elbow is lost similarly if the patient had 145 degrees before the injury or the disease the patient tends to lose the last 10 to 20 degrees of movement so this is the importance and this is the golden rule of the elbow the, and also i want you to understand that nature is so intelligent what nature has done is nature has understood that whenever an elbow is injured or whenever an elbow has a frag, uh, has a disease the elbow is going to lose the terminal range so what nature has decided nature has decided that if you have between 30 degree flexion to 130 degree flexion you can do all activities of daily living so all activities of daily living can be easily achieved by having an elbow flexion between 30 degrees of flexion to 130 degrees of flexion which means uh, uh, previously i showed you a patient with an elbow flexion deformity but let me challenge you that that patient with an elbow flexion deformity up to 10 up to 20 or up to even 30 degree can have a reasonably normal range of movement or reasonably normal lifestyle as compared to anybody who has got full range of movements of the elbow. This is nature's adjustment. So nature tries to always adjust and therefore we should know this and you can also try it out for yourself between 30 and 130 degrees is where everything happens. However, if the person is an athlete or uh, you know in some high-end profession that requires complete extension or complete flexion, then it may be a little difficult. Otherwise, we'll be able to do most of the activities. Again, this is a very important take-home message. It's not not about you know mugging up a few tests here and a few tests there. These are the very important concepts of life that we as medical students should know. Okay, now we finished measuring the elbow range of movements now let us measure the carrying angle of the patient to measure the carrying angle of the patient you can either make the patient lie down so that you will be able to place your goniometer on the surface of the body or you can also measure the carrying angle in a standing position while uh, i told you the prerequisite for measuring a carrying angle is the patient should have full extension of the elbow and your goniometer has to face upwards to a center point between the outer edge of the uh, shoulder contour and the axilla. So between this point and this point, mark a point and that's where the goniometer limb has to face. The other area that the goniometer limb has to face is the center of the elbow. So you have to mark this point and mark this point and then ensure your goniometer is faced in the correct direction and ensure that your goniometer is centered on the elbow. This is how you measure the carrying angle of the elbow. Okay, now the other measurement is measuring the arm girth. Okay, so why you want to measure the girth of the arm or the arm circumference? This is the girth of the arm. Why you want to measure it? We want to measure it because we want to know whether there is any wasting. I am dealing with an elbow case, okay? I am dealing with a patient who has got an elbow injury or disease, but I want to know whether my elbow injury or disease has caused wasting of the muscles of my arm. And therefore, you are going to measure the arm girth. When you measure this arm girth, for uniformity's sake, you will have to fix a point at which you want to measure the arm girth. In this example, what this examiner has done is, he is actually measuring from the olecranon tape and he has taken a point, he has taken 18 centimeters or anything. So he, you take a fixed point and the same point he has to use on the opposite side. That's important. Therefore, he has to, then only he will be able to measure the arm girth at the same point on either side of the body. And why other side has to be measured? You cannot say arm girth is reduced or increased. You can only say that the arm girth has reduced when compared to the normal side. So if you have a patient with bilateral elbow pathology, this test is out of the window. You have to throw it out. This test does not apply. This test applies only for a patient with a unilateral elbow pathology, assuming the other side is normal. So here he has taken the olecranon tip as the measuring point for the arm girth that is he has taken 18 centimeters 
depending on the length or of the arm you can take 20 15 whatever the other thing that i prefer to do is i prefer to take the lateral epicondyle as a measuring point from there i go upwards uh, it's almost the same thing again on this side also i use the lateral epicondyle why that is important is because there you've already marked the lateral epicondyle and therefore you have uh, a marked point already ready so from there i actually take 10 15 uh, centimeters upwards mark the point where i'm going to take the angle and do it in the opposite side also from the lateral epicondyle you can also go to the forearm and mark a point where you want to take the arm curve. so again from the lateral epicondyle mark a point where you are going to take the arm curve. however i want to warn you that a forearm is quite conical and therefore whenever you do this limb girth measurement you will have to maximize your chances of taking the girth at the point where the maximum muscle bulk is there so i don't want you people to go down here and measure the arm girth because then when you measure and compare with the opposite side the difference may not be striking however in the forearm you try to keep it as proximal as possible but not very proximal don't go and measure the elbow try to keep it as proximal as possible where the maximum arm girth is there for arm girth is there in the elbow in the arm you have to go somewhere to the center because that is where the maximum girth of the biceps, uh, brachialis and the tri triceps comes. So that's about measuring the arm girth and comparing it with opposite side. Whenever you are measuring the arm girth, how are you going to report it? So you are not going to report and tell that yes, uh, sir actually the arm girth on the right side is 15 centimeters, the arm girth on the left side is uh, 14 centimeters. No you are going to tell about the pathological limb and how much it is deficient as compared to the normal. So if you have pathological limb 14 centimeters arm girth and normal limb 16 centimeters arm girth, you are going to report it as uh, your 14 and 16 doesn't make a difference. You are going to report it as 2 centimeters uh, wasting in the affected arm as compared to the normal arm. That is going to be your report. Now coming to palpation of the brachial artery. Now what happens here is like we have we have to always once we are done with examination of any joint we should also I told you we see the limb as a whole and therefore you should be able to palpate the blood vessels whichever are palpable in that limb and do a neurological examination of that limb. Okay so here basically the examiner is palpating the brachial artery. The landmark for palpating the brachial artery is little bit of flexion of the forearm, uh, sorry, flexion of the elbow and feel the biceps tendon, go just medial to the biceps tendon and you will see a beautiful pulsation of the brachial artery. You are very much aware of this point because uh, you use this point also to measure the blood pressure. Now this brachial artery point is very important because not just you are actually checking whether the brachial artery is pulsating you are also going to check the brachial artery the volume with regards to with or with in comparison to the normal limb so that's a comparative check uh, sometimes you can have a swelling over the brachial artery in this case you are clearly seeing a swelling over the side so this is the elbow this is the lateral side and this is the medial side and you are seeing a beautiful swelling here and if you have real time pictures it would have been a pulsatile swelling so basically what you have underlying here is a pseudo aneurysm of the brachial artery so you have aneurysms and we have pseudo aneurysm so brachial artery more, most commonly it's a pseudo aneurysm in popliteal artery most commonly it is an aneurysm right so even uh, we also in our hospital uh, a few months ago we had a child who presented to us with a supracondylar fracture and uh, the fracture was reduced and we even did a pin fixation for the child and when the child came back for follow up when we were examining the child to look at the pins suddenly we noticed that in front of the elbow there was a mild pulset pulsation and um, immediately we palpated it and we could feel the pulsation and it was then diagnosed to be a pseudo aneurysm of the brachial artery. It's a very, very dangerous condition because suddenly the pseudo aneurysm can throw a thrombus distally and can completely occlude the radial artery and the ulnar artery 
or one of the vessels and this can lead to gangrene of the upper limb. So this child was immediately admitted and the plastic surgery team helped us by excising the brachial artery that sorry excising the pseudo aneurysm and the part of the brachial artery that was affected by the pseudo aneurysm was also excised and the saphenous vein of the child was taken from the leg and uh, grafting of the brachial artery was done. So the place where we are taking out the brachial artery there is a defect. So we cannot pull the vessels and stitch it. So to prevent tension in the vessel we take a vein graft and we uh, suture the patient. Uh, we reconstruct the vessel. These days we can also there are also artificial grafts available which have got the same texture and same biocompatibility as a vessel. So this is for palpation of the brachial artery. All of you know about palpation of the radial artery and ulnar artery and palpation of radial artery and ulnar artery are prerequisites for a, any elbow examination. That is why I have put it here. And finally coming to assessing the nerves. So if you have a patient with elbow injury, I am definitely not going to bore you by getting into nerve examination and all those things because each of these three nerves would be easily two to our classes of mine. Uh, however, I just want to give you a perspective of nerve examination with regards to elbow examination. Now, whenever I have an elbow patient with an elbow injury or an elbow pathology, the nerve that I am worried about is the ulnar nerve and the median nerve. I am not so worried about the radial nerve because the radial nerve, there is a high chance of injury when I have a humerus fracture. But when I have an elbow fracture or an elbow dislocation or an elbow pathology, I am worried more about the ulnar nerve and the median nerve. Why? Because these two nerves, the ulnar nerve is posteriorly posterior to the elbow just behind the median epicondyle. The median nerve is anterior to the elbow and is usually in, uh, affected or pressed when we have a supracondylar fracture. Now these are important injuries and therefore any patient presenting with a ulnar uh, elbow uh, injury or a elbow disease, I will take a lot of care in checking the patient's median nerve and ulnar nerve and for completion sake, I will also be checking the radial nerve. So what are the checks for median nerve and ulnar nerve? It's for you to read and uh, find out. Okay. So no discussion of the elbow is complete without checking for supination and pronation. Supination and pronation is something between that something that happens between the elbow and the wrist. So okay, so here is the elbow, here is the wrist. So this supination and pronation are very very important functions of the upper limb. So if not for supination and pronation, no mobile phone activity, no mobile phone usage. Even as I am using the mouse here, I am basically having a pronated hand to use the mouse. So mobile phone, either you need supination to hold the phone or pronation to um, type your uh, messages. And the other thing is, most important, a basic human function of feeding yourself requires supination. Okay. However, to take the food from the plate, you need pronation. So every day, every moment, we are using this function of supination and pronation. Now, this is a beautiful function that takes place at a joint, at a complex joint called the superior radio ulnar joint, which is the articulation between the proximal ulna and the proximal radius. Second, the inferior radio ulnar joint, which is the articulation between the distal ulna and the distal radius. And third is the introsseous membrane. So it's a very complex joint. So it's a complex joint made up of superior radio ulnar joint, inferior radio ulnar joint, and the introsseous membrane. So all these three put together will give you supination and pronation. If your superior radio ulnar joint is damaged, or injured in any condition, supination, pronation, you can kiss goodbye and it is a gone case. Okay, I'll give you an example. An example would be a Montagia fracture where you have dislocation or disruption of the proximal radius. So the annular ligament is torn and the tie that has the annular ligament has got with uh, of the proximal uh, 
radius is lost and the patient's pronation and supination is gone. Similarly, if you have a distal radius fracture or a coalesce fracture, then that can lead to disruption of the distal radio ulnar joint. And this disruption of the distal radio ulnar joint is going to take your supination and pronation and throw it out of the window. You're going to lose it. And finally, if you have any pathology or fibrosis or calcification in the interosseous membrane, then your supination and pronation is gone. Okay. So this is how physiologically it looks in supination. However, this is how it looks in pronation. So basically what is happening is a beautiful dance sequence where the ulna is still straight. Ulna is straight both in pronation and supination. And the proximal radius is also in contact with the ulna. But the radius takes a full 180 degrees turn and goes to the other side. That's the most beautiful thing about supination and pronation. One very important factor that leads to this is the radial bow. You see, the radius is in touch distally, in touch proximally, but in the center it's as away as possible. So this thing what you're seeing is called the radial bow. And the radial bow is the thing that actually maintains the supination and pronation. If you have loss of the radial bow because of injury to the shaft of radius also, the pain, you will lose the supination and pronation. Now, uh, what does uh, what are the muscles that do this supination and pronation? So the main supinator, the sorry, the main pronator is the pronator teres, also helped by the pronator quadratus. The main supinator is the not the supinator muscle. It's actually the biceps brachii. The biceps brachii is the main supinator. It's not shown in this picture. And a secondary supinator is the supinator muscle. Uh, so this is so, uh, so when the when the pronator teres contracts, this shortens and the radius is moved from here and comes here, as in this. And this is also aided by the contraction of the pronator quadrant. The reverse happens when the supinator contracts and the biceps contracts. Now, how do you assess the supination and pronation? Every elbow patient, every elbow examination is not complete without assessing the pronation and supination. So, where will you fix this? You will fix this in your elbow inspection. So, in the same elbow inspection, you will push in supination and pronation. Why I didn't push in when I did elbow inspection? I didn't push in that, that this concept because I wanted you to appreciate and understand what is supination and pronation and therefore I brought it out of the concept. But this would be an inspectory finding of the elbow. Which one? Checking for supination and pronation. So here this is the neutral position of the elbow seen by the flexion of the elbow and the forearm in neutral position. This is supination of the elbow, sorry, supination of the forearm and this is pronation of the forearm. So it's an inspectory finding. However, I also want to emphasize that even in the wrist examination also, compulsorily you have to talk about supination and pronation. Why? Because it's a function not just of the, uh, of the elbow, it's also a function of the wrist. Okay. So this is how you measure the supination and pronation. Now you need a limb for your goniometer. But when you take a fist, you don't have a limb. So the very simple trick would be to give a nice pen into the subject's hand. And a very important thing when you are checking is to ensure that the elbow is in contact with the body. That's very important. Because any deficiency or supination and pronation can be compensated by abducting or adducting the shoulder. I'll show you, show you a picture which then you'll understand better. Therefore, when you're checking the patient for supination and pronation, you have to tell the patient that, hey, yes, boss, your elbow has to be in contact with your body. And how do you ensure the patient does that? You ensure the patient does that, does that by you yourself demonstrating what you're expecting the patient to do. So here, has to be the elbow in contact with the body. Now, and you give a pen into the patient's hand, easily you can check for the supination angle and the 
supination and low. So normally the supination is between 80 and 90 degrees and the pronation is also between 80 and 90 degrees. Also by giving two pens in each hand, that is uh, one pen in each hand, you will also be able to see the symmetry of supination versus the symmetry of pronation. That's the other way to do it. Okay. So now I told you how a patient can actually make up for lack of supination. Now you will see that this girl is not able to have full pronation. She has pronation, no doubt, but it is not full pronation. Now let's say she's got to write something on the table or on the book or she needs to pick up something in full pronation. All that she will do is she will gently abduct her shoulder. The moment the patient abducts the shoulder, the deficiency in pronation is taken care of. So this is called a trick movement for pronation. This is easy if you have a deficiency in pronation. But if the what, what is it for the reverse? For the reverse it is difficult. If you have a deficiency in supination, you will have to adduct the shoulder where the shoulder comes inside. So as the shoulder comes inside, it will be very obvious to everybody that this person has got a deficiency in supination. So therefore, the patient also, when you tell the patient to do the pronation and supination movements, the patient, what they will do is they will actually slowly abduct or adduct their shoulder and ensure that they fool you. So to prevent them from fooling us, what do we do? We have to ensure that the patient keeps the elbow close to the body. That is the elbow is in contact with the body. So when the patient's elbow is in contact with the body, easily we know if the patient's pronation is restricted or the patient's supination is restricted. So that was the prerequisite for checking pronation and supination. With that, I have come to the end of the elbow examination. Thank you all for joining the class. Good luck and take care.